uh, every year about 70 to 80,000 children are being diagnosed with cancer. And 80% of this load is the leukemic burden. So pediatric leukemias, and in that also the acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which we're going to discuss today, is the most common childhood malignancy. So in your, uh, you know, in your journey as a healthcare professional, uh, definitely you will come across these children either presenting to you with uh, a diagnosis or, you know, sometimes even completing their treatment and presenting to you as a survivor of childhood cancer. So it's very important for us to be aware about how uh, these children present, how do we manage them, and a, a little bit about the treatment, the definitive treatment of pediatric leukemias. Absolutely, doctor. So the screen is all yours, doctor. Let's start with the session. And I would request all my attendees to pay close attention for today's session. And if you have any doubts or you want to ask anything particular from Dr. Vasudha, please write it on the chat box. We'll be taking the questions at the end of the session. Thank you, everyone. Have a great session. Thank you. So uh, the time allocated for me is about an hour, but I believe that no one's attention span is beyond 30 to maximum 40 minutes. So I will keep my discussion on limited only to that. And uh, this is a case-based discussion. These are uh, children that we have come across in my clinical practice. So I would really urge for all of you to participate, make it more interactive so that you know it can be a uh, good knowledge sharing between us. Sorry. Yeah, so I will dive right into the cases. Um, this is 11 year old girl, a second child to non consanguinously married parents who came to us, this is about uh, six months ago almost, with low grade fever since five days. She was afebrile since two days before presentation, but the reason she was brought to the hospital is because parents noticed that she had few reddish spots on her legs since one day, and they thought that it could be an infection, and that's the reason why they brought her in. So the pediatrician in our hospital sent across a um, CBC, uh, before that he examined her, there was just a cervical lymphadenopathy, liver was not palpable, spleen was not palpable, and the largest lymph node was about two centimeters, but otherwise a very, very well looking child. So uh, here actually a pediatrician expected to find that this child's platelet count will be low and he was thinking of a diagnosis of immune thrombocytopenia where only your platelet counts will be low and when we got the CBC I got a call um, in the night at 10 o'clock as an emergency and this is what the CBC showed us. You can see the WBC count here is 3,89,270. So this is an a definitely a absolutely abnormal WBC count. And along with that, that's not the only lineage that is affected. You can also see that the platelet counts are only 28,000, although the hemoglobin is relatively well preserved in this case. And when you see the differential, when our pathologist saw the smear on the differential, she saw that there were 90% blasts. So what are these blasts? Blasts are nothing but this immature abnormal cells that should never appear in circulation. We can see up to 5% blasts, which are the immature precursors of lymphocytes or of the neutrophils, where we call it a myeloblast in the bone marrow. But we can never see 90% uh, circulating blast in the peripheral smear. So this is a clear cut case of leukemia. So leukemia is derived from the word leuke meaning white and emia meaning blood. So uh, when previously in the past several years ago when they saw these children uh, whose blood sample was collected they saw that it was almost white because of the high WBC number and that's how the word leukemia came across. I will come to this case again at the end. So before that, I think uh, a lot of us, uh, you know, even before I got into pediatric oncology, we all have a very dismal view of uh, cancers per se. But what I want to draw your attention to is childhood cancers are not like adult cancers. Uh, they respond very well to therapy. Uh, they're biologically very, very different. As such, they're different in the types. For example, in adults, we see more of epithelial origin cancers, for example, breast cancer, lung cancer, esophageal, gastric cancers. But in children, we see more of a primordial or a primitive 
uh, mesenchymal uh, kind of origin. For example, you can see the primitive, primitive uh, uh, blast cells of the uh, hematopoietic cell lineage, or you could see a neuroblastoma, which is a primitive cell of the adrenal and sympathetic cell origin, or a nephroblastoma. These are all called blastomas because they are very, very immature and primitive in their origin. So uh, probably because of this reason, they respond incredibly well to therapy. And this is a graph which shows uh, 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 the studies of a particular cooperative group called the St. Jude's Cooperative Group, who started off in the 1960s. And you can see that this is the survival for the acute lymphoblastic leukemia in 1960. Over a period of four years, their survival has been very, very bad. So it has been between 10 to 20%. So this is how actually the chemotherapy, the evolution of therapy for acute lymphoblastic leukemia started way back in 1960. And you can see the kind of progress that was made. And today, uh, the, in the total uh, 17 trials, which is just been completed, they started with total one and they've come to total 17. Uh, their outcomes are in excess of 90%. So you, you can see a 94% survival. Probably if I get a bad pneumonia, there are more chances of me dying from a pneumonia rather than a cancer. So this is the kind of uh, 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 improvement in survival that has been accomplished over the past six to seven decades. So what is acute leukemia? It is characterized by clonal expansion of immature hematopoietic or lymphoid precursor. So what do I mean by a clonal expansion? So, you know, all our cells divide, that is normal. So in response to injury or aging or whatever they divide, right? But each cell is different. Now, what happens in the case of a cancer, it could be any cancer, is that one particular cell gets a particular mutation in the DNA and that starts dividing and its daughter cells are absolute replicas of the parent, right? So that's when we call it as a clonal, uh, they all belong to the same. So if you type the first cell and you type the 50th cell, they will be very, very similar. So they usually come from the hematopoietic or the lymphoid precursors. Basically what happens is that these cells uh, replace the normal marrow elements with completely undifferentiated cells. And, you know, when we see them under the microscope, they are really big, their nuclei are really big with more than one nucleoli. And the cytoplasm is a very thin rim. Uh, so we call it the high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. So acute leukemias are the most common malignancies in children. And like I said earlier, 80% of the acute leukemias are lymphoblastic. That means that they're coming from the lymphoid lineage. <laughs> <clears throat> so it accounts for one fourth of all the childhood cancers. And do we see any kind of difference in the incidence of leukemia? So any particular age group. So for acute lymphoblastic leukemia, the children between the ages of two to five years are particularly, uh, you know, have a higher incidence. This is attributed to the periods of lymphoid development, the normal lymphoid development in their body. It could be the tonsils, the adenoids, other lymph nodes, uh, spleen, liver, and things like that, the hematopoietic cells. So they are dividing and they are developing, especially the lymphoid lineage of cells. That's the reason why we see an increased incidence in this age group. So is there a, a difference in the incidence in the gender? Definitely boys are seen to be uh, you know, higher, more affected than girls, but we don't know if this is a bias. And there is a link between higher birth weight and maternal history of miscarriage. And also <clears throat> more and more studies are showing that there's a lower risk of ALL in children who were breastfed for a long time. So this is the most common questions that parents ask me when their children are diagnosed with ALL. Is that what caused it? Uh, or, you know, if one child is diagnosed, is, is the sibling at risk for ALL? So what are the risk factors for developing ALL? Uh, and there are few risk factors, although we don't know, you know, exactly why uh, ALL happens in children. So it could be prenatal exposure to x-rays when the lady is pregnant, postnatal exposure to high doses of radiation, <clears throat> which are not given nowadays. Previous treatment with chemotherapy can predispose you to get a secondary leukemia and genetic conditions like Down syndrome, neurofibromatosis, Bloom syndrome, Fanconi anemia. Although in Fanconi anemia, we see AML more than ALL, ataxia telangiectasia and the leaf from any syndrome and the constitutional mismatch repair. So there is a common theme between all these syndromes is that their DNA repair mechanisms are, are faulty. 
because of which they have a higher risk of developing malignancies, specifically hematopoietic malignancies. <coughs> Sorry. So when should you think of ALL or when should you suspect ALL in a child? Because the presenting features of ALL are very, very uh, diverse. It's a very common. So you can have a child present, like we saw in that our child's case, it was fever. So I would have first thought of an infection, right? Or of an ITP. So <clears throat> the presenting features are very, very variable. Uh, they can come to you very you know, very typically with bleeding, infection, lymphadenopathy, that time it's a clear cut, you know, you know that you need to suspect ALL and they can come with fever. So prolonged fever without any etiology, you're not getting anything positive for infections. Again, that is another thing that you need to start thinking of any malignancy, bony pain. So you have children who we, we've come to us that they just stopped walking. Okay. So younger children, especially infants, toddlers, they don't ex express uh, when they, uh, you know, have any pain, but they just stop bearing weight on the bones. So the signs and symptoms of ALL uh, arise from three main things. One is... Uh, it could affect the bone infiltration by the atypical or the leukemic cell, right? That that causes bony pains. And, you know, um, obviously that leads to failure of normal hematopoiesis. Your normal cells have absolutely no place. So you have anemia, leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, extent of extramedullary disease spread. So if the disease has spread to the lymph nodes, to the liver, to the spleen, um, sometimes to the brain, so you can have manifestations because of that. The third one is, like I said, failure of normal hematopoiesis. So you could have a child come to you with pallor, fatigue, bony pain, petechiae purpura, bleeding and fever. <clears throat> you could have a child come to you with painless lymphadenopathy, hepatomegaly, spinomegaly, which reflects that the leukemia has spread. With the bone pain uh, issue, um, I will come to our second case. This is a three-year-old girl who, who was referred to us with lower backache since three months. So the mother said that there was a history of accident uh, just before this backache started and there was low grade fever and intermittent episodes of vomiting. So we did an MRI spine. Uh, there was mild anterior wedging of the lumbar and lower thoracic vertebrae and bone scan which was done previously was normal. So this child actually was a suspect for a tuberculosis of the spine and that's when during investigations when we did her workup uh, this is what it showed, hemoglobin normal. I mean, uh, it's a little low. It could be iron deficiency anemia. WBC count is normal. Look at your differential, 81% neutrophils. Platelets are normal. ESR is raised at 70. Uh, so all this goes in favor of some chronic disease, right? So it could be a uh, tuberculosis. But look at the calcium. The serum calcium was 13.6, which was quite elevated. And parallelly, when we were working up for tuberculosis, we did the X-ray chest. But the X-ray chest, our radiologist called us up and told us that the chest is fine, but look at the humerus. There were these translucent metaphyseal bands over here. And sure <clears throat> to what she suspected, we did a bone marrow evaluation, which showed 90% blast suggestive of acute leukemia. So when children come to you with musculoskeletal symptoms, it can be a very common uh, uh, symptom of cancer. It will be severe enough to interfere with sleep. So when do you suspect severe or persistent back pain, especially with stiffness? Of course, I mean, a giveaway is a cord compression signs and gait abnormalities. So not just leukemia, you can have your NHL, neuroblastoma, Ewing's, Langer hands, and <clears throat> spinal cord tumors also present like this. So the problem is that whenever these children come, uh, we usually think it's growing pains, it will just go away. Or, you know, he played a lot, that's why he had the pain. So that leads to delay in diagnosis. So whenever you are having a child with an acutely swollen joint, painful hip or a painful leg per se, always, always keep malignancy in your differential diagnosis. This is more so important because in 40% of the children with ALL, pain was the only symptom. And the problem here is that the, the children who had pain as their uh, complaint had normal CBCs. So many times what we think that, you know, we'll do a CBC, it comes normal, this child does not have a malignancy. But like even in our patient, you saw that the CBC can be absolutely normal. Pain is disproportionate to the object of science of inclination. So it's not like your juvenile idiopathic arthritis or a septic arthritis. There will be no signs of inflammation. So it's very important if you have a, <coughs> a, a doubt, go ahead and offer a bone marrow aspiration and biopsy. So the duration of symptoms may vary from days to months. <clears throat> 
uh, anorexia is common, but they, they won't have like adult cancers, like significant weight loss, bony pain because of leukemic involvement of the periosteum and bone. Younger children, like I said, present with the limb. So the symptoms of generalized arthralgia, uh, it's very important to dis differentiate them from a rheumatological condition, right? So examine the spleen, examine the liver, and it's important to get the relevant blood work done. So how do we establish the diagnosis? Now we know the symptoms. You have a child with a suspect leukemia. What will help you to diagnose this child? Most easiest investigation is a complete blood count. But always ask for a peripheral smear examination by your pathologist along with the complete blood count. Many times we've had uh, children come with normal CBCs, but there will be 80% lymphocytes. And when we see the smear, the, the lymphocytes are actually the lymphoblasts. You can get an LDH. We usually get an LDH to see uh, you know, if it's elevated or not. That reflects a tumor burden. And of course, blood chemistries like urea, creatinine, uric acid, calcium phosphate to see if there is any tumor lysis going on. So with this, we come to the second case scenario. Uh, I think this is the third one. <clears throat> this is a six-year-old child who uh, was apparently fine uh, a week ago when she developed fever. Then one week later, she had some bleeding from the nose. Again, on examination, she had bilateral cervical lymphadenopathy and the liver was palpable. She was evaluated with the CBC. So this is what the CBC showed us. If you see, the hemoglobin is 6.9, platelet count 27,000, and total leukocyte count 11,300.